Now being recorded. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is John Pollock, and I'm the Quasi HIS User Support Specialist. Today, we are concluding our spring HIS Cyber Semi Seminar Series with a talk from Dr. Jeff Horsborough, who is a research assistant professor at the Utah Water Research Laboratory at Utah State University. Dr. Horsborough has been involved with developing, documenting, and deploying many of the software application, uh, software application packages in HIS, including the Hydro Server Software Suite and the Observations Data Model. Today, he's going to be discussing uh, these tools in the context of I, the IUTAH initiative. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Jeff. And Jeff, I just want to thank you again for agreeing to uh, present today and conclude our Cyber Seminar Series. Great. Thanks, John. And I'd love to say that they saved the best for last, but I can't even really say that because I was supposed to go a couple weeks ago and had a conflict, so I'm sort of the default last speaker in the series. So thanks to Kwasi, thanks to John for inviting me to do this. Um, I'm happy to be here today to talk to you about some of the work that we're doing, um, both in using and extending the Kwasi hydrologic information system to support some of the research that we're doing here in the state of Utah. And before I jump off my first slide, I just want to acknowledge that there's several other people, Amber, Stephanie, James, Juan, Mario, and Nate, who are, are now working in my group here at the, the Water Research Lab, and, and a lot of this stuff just simply wouldn't happen without the, the great support of the, the people who are working now and have worked in the past on the Kawazi HIS. Okay, so I, Utah, which um, is going to be the focus of my talk today, is... Um, Utah's EPSCOR Track 1 Award that we just received um, starting in August of last year. And uh, hopefully some of you are uh, maybe a little familiar with the EPSCOR program. This is a statewide effort. It's a $20 million award from the National Science Foundation. And it's a little different than most NSF grants. It's not a grant at all. It's actually a cooperative agreement. And it's focused on research capacity building within just the state of Utah. Um, it's interdisciplinary and by nature multi-institution. It basically touches all of the, the major research institutions at, at, uh, in the state of Utah and also most, if not all, of the other higher education institutions in the state as well. And our project and proposal is focused on sustainable management of Utah's water resources. There's a real strong water-related focus in, in research in the state of Utah, and so we kind of rode that that wave in our F-score proposal. Uh, if you want to know more about uh, IUTAH in general, it's IUTAHFscore.org. Uh, in in uh, really 30,000 foot level uh, details, here's what IUTAH is all about. Uh, there's three research focus areas. The first is eco-hydrology, and here we're working to expand Utah's capacity in the natural sciences through instrumentation of three watersheds. And I'll talk about this more um, in a minute. But basically, it's um, you know creating a network of, of instrumented watersheds along a gradient of mountain to urban transitions, and also across a gradient of, of development in the state so that we can study eco-hydrologic processes. The second focus area is um, social and engineered water systems where we'd like to study demographic characteristics, water use behaviors, water infrastructure, and other measures of urban form, um, given that Utah has a, a very fast-growing population uh, and our water resources are sort of taxed with, with the growing population, and there's a lot of, of issues associated with transitioning agriculture to uh, urban water use and all sorts of interesting things like that that are happening. And then number three is interdisciplinary modeling and visualization, which is really bringing the first two together. So developing interdisciplinary models of both the socio, eco, hydrological, and maybe add a few more prefixes here if you want, systems to determine how changes in water availability and use alter water quantity and quality. Okay, so that's the real high-level view of, of what IUTAH is all about. And in the proposal, we, um, a group of us who are in charge of the cyber infrastructure emphasis here, developed what we called uh, a proposal for the IUTAH Modeling and Data Federation. And everybody laughs at me when I talk about the Modeling and Data Federation because it sounds very Star trek -y. Um But the idea is that we realized that in the state of Utah, we already had a lot of data resources, 
computational resources, networking resources spread throughout the state. And we're not trying to replace any of those, but rather make sure that we're more fully connected um, and that we're leveraging existing capabilities that we have already to, to um, create better linkages among the research institutions in the state. So given this, um, the idea that we, we came up with was that at, at the top here we've got observing and data collection that's going to be going on within these research watersheds that we're establishing. We're going to be collecting a whole bunch of social science related data and research focus area too. And we know there's a lot of existing agency data out there as well. Uh, USGS, National Water Information System, is collecting stream flow data, water quality data. Our state division of water quality has a lot of water quality data in the state that we, we would want to leverage. Um, obviously, networks like the NRCS's snow, snowpack telemetry network has information that we would need. And we, need, we know that we need some cyber infrastructure to manage all of that data. So in the middle section here, we've got uh, the IUTA Modeling and Data Federation, which is where we will be doing all of the data management, data archiving, data sharing. And that cyber infrastructure will supply data and information to the exploration, visualization, and analysis activities of the project, where we'll be doing some participatory modeling. We'll be developing coupled models of human and, and, and natural systems. And we also anticipate that there will be feedback from the modeling work in the design of the cyber infrastructure and the data collection that's going on. So out of this, we extracted for the cyber infrastructure group a couple of different focus areas. We knew that we needed to support the data management from, uh, for the data that's coming from the IUTA facilities, and there's a couple of facilities that we're building. I'm going to talk mostly today about this gradient along mountain to urban transitions, which is the network of aquatic and terrestrial monitoring sites that we're building. But we also have plans for a green uh, infrastructure research facility that will be producing a lot of data as well. Uh, number two, we know that we've got a broad and diverse set of faculty and students and uh, other partners working with our project. And they need to be able to discover and access not only the data that we're collecting in our facilities, but also those agency data and potentially data from national data networks like USGS, um, Quasi HIS, and other networks. Uh, that we might want to integrate. Uh, we've talked about support for integrated modeling, which is not a part of my presentation really today. Uh, number four, though, I am going to talk about towards the end of my talk, data model and resource sharing and collaboration. Supporting this large, diverse group of researchers uh, will also require some interesting infrastructure that we're now beginning to work on in collaboration with the HydroShare. Project. So I'll talk a little bit about HydroShare and how we might be able to use that for IUTA. Okay, so I've organized my talk around a set of just a few sort of questions that we set out to answer in terms of the cyber infrastructure for IUTA. And the first one is, how can we create a hardware platform that supports the diverse cyber infrastructure needs of IUTA? And this might not be interesting for some of the people on the call, but I thought I would throw some of this in there because um, there may be a few other people out there who are leading large research efforts and who are thinking about, well, if I'm going to support the data management, data collection, and, and data archival needs of my large research group, where do I get started in terms of hardware? You know, what are some of the options that I have? So I'm, I'm going to throw this information out there for you. And I think it's important to understand the development approach for cyber infrastructure on IUTA is Number one, where possible, we want to leverage and adopt existing cyber infrastructure components. So for example, we're building a network of aquatic and terrestrial monitoring sites, and the Quasi Hydrologic Information System has a bunch of infrastructure for managing those types of data. We want to use the Quasi HIS where we can. Uh, number two, we want to collaborate with other CI development activities to get needed functionality. So if the Quasi HIS doesn't do exactly what we need, then we need to maybe modify it to do a few new and interesting things. And then finally, if there's something that nobody's done before but that we really need, then um, we'll probably start some new development activity to develop additional things. But what this requires is that we have some hardware where we can have a research platform for development, prototyping, testing of servers, testing of software applications that we might want to adopt to use for this group. 
uh, we might actually need to, to develop and implement services on multiple platforms, Windows and Linux. Um, and for lots of different uses, like there might be some modeling tasks, some analysis tasks, and computational tasks that we need. And so we need this research platform, but at the same time, we need a production platform for hosting databases for all the streaming data, web services for the HIS, um, map servers, file servers, all these kinds of things that we need in a production environment. So what we have done, um, we've just deployed a virtual infrastructure here at Utah State University where we basically bought several host machines that we can configure to host lots of different virtual machines and we have shared storage that we use across all these machines. And so we no longer have um, the situation where we have to have a physical machine for every single purpose that we might want to serve in terms of a machine. I can, I can build a virtual file server, a virtual map server, a virtual database server, and a virtual web server all on the same, har sh same shared hardware and share storage. And that allows us to basically do things like quickly spinning up these virtual machines that implement different operating systems and platforms. Um, and down here towards the bottom is really geeky stuff that I'm, I'm pretty excited about, but it gives us the ability to do things like hot swapping virtual machines across the physical host. So if one of those hosts goes down or there's a problem or one of the virtual machines starts taking up a whole bunch of resources, the new virtualization software that's out there can just automatically detect that and move machines to another piece of hardware uh, and it gives us things like ensuring failover and efficiently allocating resources to multiple machines. So um, pretty cool stuff that you can do now in terms of virtualization of hardware that you might consider as you're, you're implementing your research platforms for different research sites and watersheds and, and initiatives. Okay, um, I'll only spend just a second here, and this is sort of the larger scale Utah EBSCOR cyber infrastructure picture. And, and up here in the left-hand corner, you'll see our USU VMware cluster, which is what I was just talking about. But I just want to put this in perspective of the rest of the state. We have high-performance computing uh, resources at all of the different universities. And this big, huge machine in the center is, is a very large storage purchase that we're making to put in at the University of Utah that will be serving um, as scratch storage space for high performance computing simulations, modeling, but also as redundant backup for all of the data and, and all of the machines that we're developing as part of the IUTA Federation as well. Okay, so moving on, the next question is, what is the design of a cyber infrastructure that enables standardized data collection and management for a network of aquatic and terrestrial monitoring sites uh, across the consortium of different organizations. So as part of IUTAH, we're building a research network that we're calling Gradients Along Mountain to Urban Transitions. GAMET is the acronym here. And the idea is that we're instrumenting three watersheds, um, and each of those three watersheds is affiliated in some way with, with Utah State University, University of Utah, and Brigham Young University. So we're instrumenting the Logan River, Red Butte Creek, which is above um, the University of Utah's campus, and part of the Provo River, which is near Brigham Young University. And it's a mix of aquatic and terrestrial sites that are, are going to be installed across a couple of gradients. The first is from very high elevation mountain sites to low elevation valley sites. All of the population in Utah is sort of in the low elevation valleys, whereas the mountains are more pristine. Um, and then across the, the three watersheds, we have interesting gradients of um, urbanization and development. Uh, Red Butte Creek being near Salt Lake City is about as urban as they come. Logan is starting to build out, and Provo still is a very dispersed um, agricultural watershed, so you get interesting gradients both ways. Um, here's a, a map that shows where these watersheds are actually located. Um, but there's some interesting challenges here. Num number one, they're, they're geographically dispersed. Number two, they're being managed by three different organizations, BYU, USU, and U of U, and we've actually hired field technicians to install the sites and manage the data for each of these three watersheds. Um, and, you know, there's some interesting challenges associated with how we're actually going to get the data from all of these sites into a centralized location and manage the data. 
you can see here what some of the things that we're actually going to be measuring continuously are. The terrestrial sensors are in the top of the table, and the aquatic sensors are in the bottom of the, of the table. But, you know, in, in a lot of ways, it's, it's pretty much most of the things that you can measure continuously um, are going to be part of these terrestrial and aquatic stations, um, including some enhanced stations which will have um, enhanced sensors like um, algae sensors, FDOM sensors, and nitrate sensors, whereas the, the fundamental suite is just stage temperature, electrical conductivity, pH, dissolved oxygen, and turbidity. So um, not all of them will have ever, everything that you see in this table, but um, there's sort of a, a split between fundamental suites and, and enhanced suites. But this gives you an idea of um, there will be on the order of, of 25 of these sites spread across the three watersheds. And, you know, with, with each of these variables measuring on the orders of, you know, every half hour to every hour, uh, we're going to need some infrastructure to manage all of this data. So those challenges, it's not just the volume of data, but also there's some potential for some heterogeneity. We've got multiple watersheds, multiple institutions, synchronizing timing, access, equipment tracking, and everything like that across the three watersheds is challenging. And we'd love to find some opportunities for standardizing as much of this as we can, including the quality assurance and quality control of the sensor data uh, that we're going to be getting from these watersheds. This is a slide from one of the papers we put together a while ago that talks uh, in general terms about the Quasi Hydrologic Information System cyber infrastructure. Um, there's basically the sensors and monitoring infrastructure, which we consider kind of one tier of the cyber infrastructure, uh, the sensor nodes, the periodic monitoring, the, the samples that you go out and collect. The second tier is, is the communication tier, where you're getting all of that data back to some sort of centralized location. And then there's this third tier where we need to do all of the data storage, processing, and analysis. And, and that's where most of the Quasi Hydrologic Information System tools lie, is in this third tier. And so we are proposing to use the Hydro Server software suite, which we've been working on uh, as part of the Quasi HIS project for the last, oh, I don't know, how long has it been now? Six or seven years. Um, and that we continue to do develop, development on. Um, and the way we're going to manage this is that each of those three watersheds, all of the sites are going to send their data via some sort of telemetry. There will be a mix of cellular, radio, internet um, telemetry that we're, we're now designing the network. All of those sites are going to send their data back to primary observations data model databases at Utah State University. And then we're, we'll have redundant copies and backup in that large storage infrastructure that I mentioned at the University of Utah. And, of course, we're going to use the Quasi Hydrologic Information Systems Observations Data Model to support the loading and storage of this data. And, and hopefully most of you who are on the call have, have seen or, or uh, have heard of at least the Observations Data Model. But this is essentially the relational database structure that allows us to store all of the sensor data. Um, it gives us uh, the ability to store not only the data but all the associated metadata about sites and variables and, and methods and sources. And it, it also promotes the syntactic and semantic consistency across all of these watersheds. So we can actually ask the different data managers to use the control vocabularies that come with the observations data model, and we can standardize a lot of the, um, the data storage and descriptions in ODM. Uh, we plan on using the streaming data loader to manage and, and actually automate the loading of all of the streaming data from these sites into instances of the observations data model. And then once it's actually in those ODM databases, we, we need to actually be able to give access to the remote data managers, because we have a data manager for each site, one for the Logan, Red Butte Creek, and one for BYU. And they're actually employed and sitting at each of the three universities. And so that presents some interesting challenges in terms of institutional firewalls, because in between these ODM databases and the people over here on the right-hand part of the slide it are you know, multiple institutional firewalls that we're now working with the various IT departments to, to figure out how we're going to poke enough holes to get, get the access through that we need. Down here at the bottom of this slide, um, I'm mentioning ODM Tools here, which is an, a client application for the Quasi HIS Observations Data Model um, 
that allows you to visualize. And there are some data editing capabilities in ODM tools for doing some pretty simple quality assurance of um, sensor data, cleaning it up after it comes in from the field because it's an inherently messy. Anyone who's dealt with sensor data knows this. But the issue right now is that ODM tools has a nice graphical user interface. It's got a nice set of tools for doing some data editing. But it doesn't actually record what's going on as somebody's doing the data editing. It doesn't preserve the provenance of the data edits. And so we'd like to improve upon the methods of, of ODM tools to create a provenance train for all the edits that are made to a, a sensor data stream. So to do that, we, we actually went back and we evaluated ODM tools and said, well, the, the best approach to this would be to add a scripting interface so that every time I click on one of those buttons on the toolbar to do something like delete a data point or interpolate a data point, it would record a line of code in a script. And then when I'm done, I save that script and I have a whole processing chain that then saves everything that I've done to that time series. And we wanted to do that in Python because we thought Python is, is great, and I still think Python is great. But it was going to be really hard to implement it in the existing ODM tools. So we did a little bit of prototyping to see if, how hard it would be to actually implement the whole ODM tools graphical user interface in Python. And it turns out there's some really good tools for doing that in Python. And so we've got a new version of ODM tools that we have not released yet, but we're getting pretty close. That's all written in Python. And this gives us a couple of really cool um, additional capabilities. Number one, uh, as I'll show you here in a second, it actually gives us the ability to integrate a Python console and a scripting window so we can do what I was talking about in terms of the scripting. But it also gives us the ability to connect to multiple relational database management systems. So if you want to use ODM in, in SQL Server, uh, ODM in MySQL, or ODM in Postgres, uh, this version of ODM tools will do that. Um, you've still, uh, we've, we've modernized the interface a little bit, put a bunch of the buttons up on the, the ribbon. Um, most of the same functionality is here, but we've, we've modified it so that we can do multiple time series plots uh, at the same time. So if you're editing a data series, you can actually see uh, multiple time series at once, which is really useful. Uh, the multiple plot types are still there, as they were in the last version of ODM Tools. And we've changed the, the series selection interface at the bottom uh, so that you can basically uh, select any combination of time series that show up in the series selector form here at the bottom. So I can select, say, dissolved oxygen at two separate sites and plot them at the same time on the plot. And I can actually create a query to, to determine um, which series are shown in the view and which ones are actually showing on the plot. Uh, we've change the interface so all of the pieces of the window are dockable and undockable. So I can do things like having a plot window, and then I can undock that series selector. I can open a table view of the underlying data and pull it off to the side. So everything, all of the windows in ODM Tools Python are, are dockable and movable, which is, I think is pretty cool. And then what we really wanted to get to, though, was the sensor data quality control. Um, we all know that when sensor data come in from the field, they have all sorts of interesting things like, you know, we get sense sediment in our sensor cups all the time and that affects the measurements of things like dissolved oxygen. Uh, we get sensor drift and, and shifts when we go out and, and calibrate. We get all sorts of interesting and strange anomalies that happen. Occasionally our batteries die when it gets really cold and, and um, it does get cold in Logan. So we go through a lot of, of dead batteries. But We've changed the ODM tools interface now so that we've coupled the, the plot display with the series selector. So I select a time series for editing. It shows up in the plot. I can also have a tabular view if I want. All of the editing tools are up on the, the ribbon. I select a time series for editing. And then every time I click one of those tools on the toolbar, it actually, uh, puts a line of code down in the Python script editor. And if you look really close, there's a line of code here that says series.filter value greater than 8. So basically, I've, I've created a line of code that has now selected all of the values in this time series that are greater than 8. And then I can do some sort of, of modification or um, delete those values if I think they're bad. And then when I'm done with all of my edits, I would save that script. And um, I could come back to it later on if I wanted to. 
So we're incorporating basically all of the edit editing in ODM tools by using Python code now rather than just having the, the GUI that doesn't record any of the, the provenance. Okay, um, an additional tool that we're working on, um, because this network of sites is cross-institution, cross-watershed, we've got lots of different people working, um, we needed the capability to be able to um, track the physical infrastructure, uh, the sensors, the data loggers, the batteries, the deployments, where they are, where they've been deployed, what's the calibration history, when have they been sent to the factory, all of those kinds of things that, that really affect the data to a great degree, but are not recorded in any way in most cases, except in field notebooks when people go out. And, and when we publish the data, we don't typically include all of that kind of information. Um, we're building a database to store all of this information, and we're also building a web interface so that the field technicians, who are actually the ones going out to the field, can put in all the information about each of the pieces of equipment, and then there would you know, you'd go into this web interface, you'd be able to see the, the information about each piece of equipment. If it's a sensor or a data logger, you'd be able to see who manufactured it, who the vendor was that we purchased it from, who owns it. And then there would be buttons that say things like view deployment history, view factory service history, view calibration history. And this is really the nuts and bolts of managing a research watershed or site because you really need to do all of this kind of stuff. But we haven't found really great tools uh, out there for keeping track of all this kind of information. Um, so every time I would go to a site, I would enter information about that site visit, who went to the site, which site did I go to, when did I go. There might be some environmental observations. Uh, but then I would record all of the activities that I performed at that site. I did a calibration of a particular sensor. I deployed another temperature sensor on the weather station or something like that. And so all of those things would be recorded in this database and available through this web interface that we're developing. Uh, finally, there would be like a, cal a calendar view that would enable the, the different watershed technicians to see things like, well, when did, the, when did the University of Utah technician go to Red Butte Creek Site 1 last, and, and what did he do when he went there? So all of that would kind of show up on this calendar view, and we would be able to see things like site visits, factory service events or, or whatever we decide want, we want to show up on the calendar. Okay, and I wanted to just throw a plug in here for uh, the ODM2 effort that we're working on as well. It's, it's not necessarily part of IUTA, but a lot of this sensor data management and sensor uh, inventory data logger uh, kind of stuff is all part of what I would consider a sensor extension to uh, the observations data model. And the, the model that we're pursuing with the next version of ODM is that there would be a, a core set of observations metadata that most observations have in common, but that if I'm dealing with sensor data, I would have a whole separate set of metadata that go with that. Or if I have sample-based data, there would be a similar samples extension that has metadata for samples. Um, and so we've got another project that we're working on right now to develop the next version of the observations data model in a more modular fashion um, that uses some of this work that we're doing now. Okay, the last question I think in my presentation is how can we enable and increase collaborative research and sharing of data and models through the innovative use of cyber infrastructure? This is where um, the whole modeling and data federation comes in that we have proposed, and we've begun to build this out, and the URL for that is data.iutahebscore.org. So if you, you want to know about our development efforts and what we're working on in terms of IUTAH, go to that URL. There's some good information there. We're, we're just getting started building this out, though. Um, one of the first things that everybody on the project asked for was, well, we really want to be able to figure out what data resources we have already and what types of data we're really going to be dealing with and what types of models people are currently using and how we might be able to take advantage of existing stuff. So we built a set of um, inventory forms where people could submit metadata about particular data sets uh, so that we can basically be able to uh, build the historical story of data in each of these three watersheds uh, that make up the IUTA focus. Now, I want to transition just a little bit here to thinking data a little more generally, and not just sensor data, but data in general. And I, I stole this 
graphic from a paper by Bill Michener, um, which he wrote in 2006, which is called Meta Information Concepts for Ecological Data Management. But certainly, this is not just about ecological data. But it, it introduces the concept of information entropy. And if you plot the information content of data and metadata on the y-axis and time on the x-axis, what, what Michener suggests here is that at the time of publication, the data has and metadata have the most value. And then things start happening, like a little bit of time passes, and as the, the data creator, I start to forget some of the specific details about problem with individual data items or, or things that came up in the field. As a little bit more time passes, then even some of the general things start getting lost. Uh, if I have a hard drive failure, uh, there's a precipitous drop, obviously, and, and data can be lost. Uh, if I retire, then a lot of times my data goes with me. Uh, my filing cabinets get emptied out. They burn everything that, that I had to, to make space for the next person coming in. And eventually do, people do um, pass away and, and there's you know, institutional information lost. So this slide right here suggests that over time there's a, a basically a decreasing value of data and metadata. But I'm wondering if we could suggest instead, if we have the same plot of information content of data and metadata over time, if we have the right set of tools and repositories that when we publish a paper using the data, we publish the data itself, it has a certain value. We curate it inside a data repository and we make it available for people to use and reuse and, and that might actually increase its value a little bit. Um, somebody finds that data and decides that it's really interesting or useful for another purpose, and they make some sort of annotation on that data and say, well, I use this for this particular model, and it was the perfect data to use for this model. If you're, if you're testing your model, you might want to use this data too. Then that's adding some value potentially to that data. And then eventually, maybe that data set's used in another publication, and somebody else cites that data set, and, and that could potentially add value as well. So maybe the value of data doesn't necessarily have to decrease over time if we have the right set of tools for managing and annotating and, and publishing data sets. But there's some requirements associated with this. Number one, we need to start thinking of data sets as products that we can share and publish, which I think is happening now to a d great degree. But I think we might want to shift, too, to start thinking of data sets as social objects that can be not only shared, but also commented on, um, annotated, and become part of social networking um, systems like the HydroShare system that I'm going to talk about here in just a minute. There's some other requirements still, though, like if I'm going to do all of this sharing of data, we need to be able to find out what data resources are available, how do I actually get them, and how can I, as a scientist, share what I have. So in the interim, while we're building some of these collaborative data sharing tools, uh, we needed for the IUTA project somewhere to start, just start putting stuff that people were amassing. And I threw this slide in there just because some of you might be interested. That there's a system out there called OwnCloud that's kind of like a Dropbox alternative. And if, if you need a system to do file sharing uh, and you don't like Dropbox, this is an alternative. The difference is own cloud, you can install on your own hardware, you have complete control over who has access. And the nice thing about that is if you're working with social scientists, which we are working with social scientists, um, their IRB requirements probably require you to not use a system like Dropbox for sharing things because you don't have full control over who has access to it. So because we've installed this on our own servers as our kind of temporary holding space, we have complete control, we have um, access control, and we can use it like Dropbox, but um, it doesn't have some of the same limitations as Dropbox. But what we really want to get to is data publication using national networks like uh, the Kwasi HIS and the new Kwasi Data Center. We'd like to use HydroShare, and Data One is also a player in this space. And we'd like to focus on publishing collaborative data products in a way that they can be cited as research products and also easily accessed. So HydroShare is, uh, hopefully some of you have heard of HydroShare. We're now working on HydroShare. It's a collaborative sharing uh, environment for both data and models. 
the first beta version of HydroShare just came out in the last couple weeks, and we're now doing some of testing on the first beta version. That has a relatively limited set of functionality, but it treats data as social objects, and not just data, also models, model instances, and other digital content. And HydroShare is really aiming at changing the way we share data and even potentially the way we do science, um, making collaboration easier and really making this process of creating, curating, and sharing data sets easier. This is what it looks like um, if you go to uh, the, the version of HydroShare that's actually been released. And if I sign in, I get a dashboard that shows me what essentially my content that I've added to the system. So if I start uploading data sets, it, it adds them to my dashboard. And based on my preferences in the system and things that I've done and searches that I've done, it might actually suggest uh, people that I might want to follow or other data sets that I might be interested in based on uh, the content of data that I've shared or, or the searches that I've done. My content shows up in the system, so each one of these lines in this table is a, a different data set that I've uploaded to the system, and, and I, as the owner of those, those data, get to decide who I'm going to share them with and, and who has access and who can see those data. And each individual data set actually has a details page that, dis, that shows all of the metadata associated with that data set, and more importantly, has specific functionality that goes with that data set. So for example, this data set is a, an Esri shape file of the locations of my monitoring sites in the Little Bear River, and so the set of options that show up at the top might be specific to shape files, for instance. And then at the bottom, there's a formal citation for my data set, and, and we're still working on the format of that citation, but the idea is that each data set within HydroShare would have a formal uh, referenceable citation that would be permanent uh, that when I decide I want to make this data set permanent and share it, people can actually point at it and cite it in the same way you could cite a, uh, a journal article. So you could basically see this page the same way as a journal article landing page, which, you know, when you go to a journal article's landing page, you get sort of the abstract and the author and all that kind of information, and then you would actually click on the, you know, get full text PDF to, to view the paper, but you get that landing page that has all the metadata about the paper. There would be within HydroShare, we're, we're working on the design of the data discovery interface, but the idea of providing map-based browsing and, and geospatial searches, keyword-based searches, uh, doing searches based on resource types, and then we would have the convenience of being able to search or sort search results by uh, potentially relevance, the titles, the owners, um, the concept of rating data sets, so highly rated data sets might pop to the, the top of your search, uh, or date-based um, sorting as well. Finally, within HydroShare, I think the last thing I want to talk about here is that I, as a researcher, might want to come into HydroShare, uh, and this is something that I'm really excited about. Since I'm running a small research watershed in the Little Bear River, and I have a bunch of collaborators, I want to be able to create a research group that I can actually share resources with so that, you know, Amber doesn't have to call me up on the phone and say, hey, where did you put the shapefile of the watershed boundary for the Little Bear River? Uh, we can just put all of that stuff and organize it in HydroShare under the Little Bear River Research Group, and then it's all there. Uh, we know exactly when it was created and by whom and, and what everything represents. So I'm excited about the, the collaborative group-based functionality so that, uh, we can no longer have like 50 different copies of everything. We can just put everything in one place and then people can always access it uh, within HydroShare. So some next steps for us. Uh, we're working on accessing agency and national data sets, working with agencies here in Utah and also trying to figure out how we can best leverage what's already been done by the Quasi Hydrologic Information System Project and others in terms of partnerships with people like USGS and, and EPA Storet and other sources. Uh, we would like to, to work on this idea of supporting data discovery and access across not only the IUtah data sets that we're collecting, but also all of these external data sources um, mediating across different sources, formats, and semantics. Uh, enhancing the tools for collaboration and sharing of models and data through partnerships with um, with HydroShare. We see that as a really important partnership with us uh, coming up in the future. 
and that will support the data publication with national networks that we're, we really want to do to support uh, the collaboration among our different um, institutions, universities, and researchers. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions related to, you know, anything that I've presented today. Hopefully I haven't taken too much time. Thank you very much, Jeff, uh, for the great talk here. Um, yeah, we'd like to definitely invite people to ask questions now by typing in the chat box. And you can unmute your line by pressing star six in case you want to have a discussion. So we have a couple of questions already, Jeff. And the first one is how to join HydroShare. Ah, this is an excellent question. So in the beginning, since we've just released the first beta version of HydroShare, we're using a, an invitation model um, in the same way that Google used an invitation model when they started the Google Drive. Uh, you couldn't just sign up for Google Drive when it first came up. You had to be invited by somebody who was invited by somebody who was invited by somebody. But we're doing that for a specific reason. Um, the first beta version is based on a canonical use case that we came up with that has very limited functionality. And we want to make sure that we're we're basically giving access to people who are going to give us some feedback and who, whose expectations are such that this is the very first beta version. Um, and so if you want to evaluate the first beta version of HydroShare, then my suggestion is to get in touch with myself or David Tarbotten or Ray Idasic and say, I want to be a really friendly reviewer. I'm really interested in giving you guys some feedback. Um, if you don't want to be a really friendly reviewer, maybe it might be best to wait a little bit longer. But please, you know, we, we want to make this a, a community project and, a, and build a community around this. So if you're really interested in, in joining that community and providing feedback, let us know. Thanks, Jeff. So another question we have is about the relationship between HydroShare and the other components of HIS. Are data in HydroShare harvested, or will, will they be harvested by HIS Central or discoverable within Hydro Desktop? That's a great question, and I see that one came from Josh Cole, so thanks, Josh, for your question. Um, we are now working on the relationships between the Kawazi Data Center and HydroShare. We would very much like, I, I showed you that data search interface in HydroShare, and we would very much like to have the capability to um, present all of the resources that have already been published in Kawazi HIS through the HydroShare search interface, okay? And what that means is if I put in a keyword and a time range and draw a geographic bounding box, I should be able to find things that have been shared in either HydroShare and or things that have already been shared via the Quasi HIS. Um, the, one of the differences is HydroShare, uh, we're not constraining what you can actually share via HydroShare. Uh, you can share time series, you can share geospatial data sets, you can share, you know, and, and even under geospatial data sets, it might be a, a shape file, it might be a geodatabase, it might be um, a net CDF file, whatever it happens to be. HydroShare is going to support a much broader um, set of data than the, the quasi HIS as it is currently instituted, pretty focused around time series. So that being said, Right now, there's no plans really to change anything related to the Quasi HIS. It's an operational system that is now being moved into uh, under the auspices and support and umbrella of the Quasi Data Center, which is important to understand as well because there will be professional support for the Quasi HIS ongoing through the data center. Uh, so we're working out the details of how all of the linkages are going to happen, but please Hopefully nobody got the message that Quasi HIS is going away and Quasi HydroShare is here to stay. I think they're, they're two separate and related pro projects and products that we would like to make seamlessly work together. So we have a follow-up from Josh as well on a slightly different topic, but will the equipment management piece be available publicly? Yes, absolutely. Um, if you're interested in the Python ODM tools, the code base for that is already on the, the HydroShare CodePlex site. So you can download the source code for that there. Right now, we're, we're trying to figure out what the best structure is for all of our code repositories. Um, given that the Quasi HIS project has ended and a lot of the new development that we're doing is being funded by other funding sources, 
we're just trying to figure out what what's the best way to make sure that the quasi HIS contribution is visible, that the IUTAH EBSCOR contribution is visible, and and that we're also staying current with the latest repositories and tools that are out there. So we we haven't put the the sensor data management, sorry, the the sensor equipment management database and and web interface into a repository yet, but we will be putting it in a repository and we will be releasing it under the same license that all of the rest of the quasi-HIS has been um, released under. And just for your information, Josh, we're developing the web interface in Drupal, and the back end is MySQL, so it should be free, and anybody should be able to actually you know, download it and use it on whatever platform they want to use it on. Thanks, Jeff. I actually have a question for you as well. Um, as we've seen, you have a lot of experience in developing and deploying HIS data publication tools. From your experience, uh, are there any new features you've used in this project that you think should be included in the standard Hydro server package? Um, we are slowly but surely working towards having um, a Hydro server software stack that would work on either a Windows or a Linux platform. So, for example, we've now got uh, ODM schemas for both MySQL and SQL Server. Uh, we've got a version of the Water OneFlow web services that works on Windows and one that'll work on Linux. Um, we're now working on a version of ODM tools that's written in Python that actually should work on on any platform. It should run on Windows, Linux, or a Mac, uh, which is pretty cool. And so, yes, we should definitely be rolling um, a lot of this functionality or, or all of this functionality into the Hydro server software stack when it becomes uh, production ready, basically. Great. Well, thank you very much for today's talk, Jeff. Um, unless anyone has any questions, I'd like to also thank our audience for attending today. Uh, this video uh, the, uh, will be available on YouTube as well as the Quasi website and I'll also be making PDFs of the presentation slides available on the Quasi website. So if you'd like to be notified uh, when they're available, please do shoot me an email. Uh, my email address is jpollak at quasi.org. Um, and again, thank you everyone for attending and especially thank you, Jeff, and Thank you to everyone for attending uh, the series throughout uh, the spring. Thanks again, everyone.